This inversion of reality is so pervasive that Washington's military encirclement and intimidation of Russia is not contentious. It's not even news, but suppressed behind a smear and scare campaign of the kind I grew up with during the first Cold War. Once again, the evil empire is coming to get us, led by another Stalin or, perversely, a new Hitler. Name your demon and let rip. The suppression of the truth about Ukraine is one of the most complete news blackouts I can remember. The biggest Western military buildup in the Caucasus and Eastern Europe since World War II is blacked out. Washington's secret aid to Kiev and its neo-Nazi brigades responsible for war crimes against the population of Eastern Ukraine is blacked out. Evidence that contradicts propaganda that Russia was responsible for the shooting down of a Malaysian airliner is blacked out. And again, supposedly liberal media are the censors. Citing no facts, no evidence, one journalist identified a pro-Russian leader in Ukraine as the man who shot down the airliner. This man, he wrote, was known as the demon. He was a scary man who frightened the journalist. That was the evidence. Many in the Western media have worked. Hard to present the ethnic Russian population of Ukraine as outsiders in their own country, almost never as Ukrainians seeking a federation within Ukraine and as Ukrainian citizens resisting a foreign orchestrated coup against their elected government. What the Russian president has to say is of no consequence, he is a pantomime villain who can be abused with impunity. An American general who heads NATO and is straight out of Dr. Strange Love, one general breed love, routinely claims Russian invasions without a shred of visual evidence. His impersonation of Stanley Kubrick's General Jack D. Ripper is pitch perfect. 40,000 Ruskies were massing on the border, according to Breedlove. That was good enough for the New York Times, the Washington Post and the Observer, the latter. Having previously distinguished itself with lies and fabrications that backed Blair's invasion of Iraq, as its former reporter, David Rose, revealed. There is almost the joy d'esprit of a class reunion. The drumbeaters of the Washington Post are the very same editorial writers who declared the existence of Saddam's weapons of mass destruction to be hard facts. If you wonder, wrote Robert Perry, how the world could stumble into World War III, much as it did into World War I a century ago, all you need to do is look at the madness that has enveloped virtually the entire U.S. political-slash-media structure over Ukraine where a false narrative of white hats versus black hats took hold early and has proved impervious to facts or reason. Perry, the journalist who revealed Iran-Contra, is one of the few who investigate the central role of the media in this game of chicken, as the Russian foreign minister called it. But is it a game? As I write this, the U.S. Congress votes on Resolution 758 which, in a nutshell, says, let's get ready for war with Russia. In the 19th century, the writer Alexander Herzen described secular liberalism as the final religion, though its church is not of the other world but of this. Today, this divine right is far more violent and dangerous than anything the Muslim world throws up, though perhaps its greatest triumph is the illusion of free and open information. In the news, whole countries are made to disappear. Saudi Arabia, the source of extremism and Western-backed terror, is not a story, except when it drives down the price of oil. Yemen has endured 12 years of American drone attacks. Who knows? Who cares? In 2009, the University of the West of England published the results of a 10-year study of the BBC's coverage of Venezuela. Of 304 broadcast reports, only three mentioned any of the positive policies introduced by the government of Hugo Chavez. The greatest literacy program in human history received barely a passing reference. In Europe and the United States, millions of readers and viewers know next to nothing about the remarkable, life-giving changes implemented in Latin America, many of them inspired by Chavez. Like the BBC, the reports of the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Guardian, and the rest of the respectable Western media were notoriously in bad faith. Chavez was mocked even on his deathbed. How is this explained, I wonder, in schools of journalism? Why are millions of people in Britain are persuaded that a collective punishment called austerity is necessary? Following the economic crash in 2008, a rotten system was exposed. For a split second the banks were lined up as crooks with obligations to the public they had betrayed. But within a few months, apart from a few, stones lobbed over excessive corporate bonuses, the message changed. The mugshots of guilty bankers vanished from the tabloids and something called austerity became the burden of millions of ordinary people. Was there ever a sleight of hand as brazen? 
Today, many of the premises of civilized life in Britain are being dismantled in order to pay back a fraudulent debt, the debt of crooks. The austerity cuts are said to be 83 billion. That's almost exactly the amount of tax avoided by the same banks and by corporations like Amazon and Murdoch's News UK. Moreover, the crooked banks are given an annual subsidy of 100 bn in free insurance and guarantees, a figure that would fund the entire National Health Service. The economic crisis is pure propaganda. Extreme policies now rule Britain, the United States, much of Europe, Canada, and Australia. Who is standing up for the majority? Who is telling their story? Who's keeping records straight? Isn't that what journalists are meant to do? In 1977, Carl Bernstein, of Watergate fame, revealed that more than 400 journalists and news executives worked for the CIA. They included journalists from the New York Times, Time, and the TV networks. In 1991, Richard Norton Taylor of The Guardian revealed something similar in this country. None of this is necessary today. I doubt that anyone paid The Washington Post and many other media outlets to accuse Edward Snowden of aiding terrorism. I doubt that anyone pays those who routinely smear Julian Assange, though other rewards can be plentiful. It's clear to me that the main reason Assange has attracted such venom, spite, and jealously is that WikiLeaks tore down the facade of a corrupt political elite held aloft by journalists. In heralding an extraordinary era of disclosure, Assange made enemies by illuminating and shaming the media's gatekeepers, not least on the newspaper that published and appropriated his great scoop. He became not only a target, but a golden goose. Lucrative book. And Hollywood movie deals were struck and media careers launched or kickstarted on the back of WikiLeaks and its founder. People have made big money, while WikiLeaks has struggled to survive. None of this was mentioned in Stockholm on December 1st when the editor of The Guardian, Alan Rusbridger, shared with Edward Snowden the Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel Peace Prize. What was shocking about this event was that Assange and WikiLeaks were airbrushed. They didn't exist. They were unpeople. No one spoke up for the man who pioneered digital whistleblowing and handed The Guardian one of the greatest scoops in history. Moreover, it was Assange and his WikiLeaks team who effectively, and brilliantly, rescued Edward Snowden in Hong Kong and sped him to safety. Not a word. What made this censorship by omission so ironic and poignant and disgraceful was that the ceremony was held in the Swedish parliament, whose craven silence on the Assange case has colluded with a grotesque miscarriage of justice in Stockholm. When the truth is replaced by silence, said the Soviet dissident Yevtushenko, the silence is a lie. It's this kind of silence we journalists need to break. We need to look in the mirror. We need to call to account an unaccountable media that services power and a psychosis that threatens world war. In the 18th century, Edmund Burke described the role of the press as a fourth estate checking the powerful. Was that ever true? It certainly doesn't wash anymore. What we need is a fifth estate, a journalism that monitors, deconstructs, and counters propaganda and teaches the young to be agents of people, not power. We need what the Russians called perestroika, an insurrection of subjugated knowledge. I would call it real journalism. It's 100 years since the First World War. Reporters then were rewarded and knighted for their silence and collusion. At the height of the slaughter, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George confided in C.P. Scott, editor of the Manchester Guardian, if people really knew the truth the war would be stopped tomorrow, but of course they don't know and can't know.